Very blessed new year. It's 2022 and we are at the start of a new calendar year. But of course, if you are following the church calendar, we are already six weeks into the new church year. Now today is the first Sunday of 2022. Technically, it still falls under the Christmas season, right? 12 days of Christmas and, you know, we should have, still have the, the, the Christ candle lit among us to remind us, right, to, to, to wait a little bit longer, to celebrate, to remain in that celebrative mood a little bit longer rather than just wanting to rush on to the next thing. Now, of course, if you, uh, if you frequent the malls, you would often notice that right after the Christmas carols end, at the end of Christmas, the Chinese New Year songs begin, right? But let's not get rushed on by the things of the world. We tarry a little longer each day in the presence of Christ, and the seasons of the church here help us to do just that. Now, it may seem strange to be talking about Christmas uh, in January, but the gospel passage today very fittingly bridges the seasons of Christmas and Epiphany. Now, we are familiar with Christmas, of course. We celebrate the birth of Jesus, God coming as man to dwell as man and to live and die for the sake of men. But Christmas, if we are very particular about what the season is about, Christmas would have no meaning if not for epiphany. Epiphany means manifesting, revealing, a process, of course, but then there are moments of bright light where suddenly God manifests Himself a little bit more clearly and reveals Himself a little bit more fully towards His people. The season of Epiphany actually begins this coming Thursday on the 6th of January. And in Epiphany, we are reminded that our God is a God who is always revealing Himself, always manifesting Himself to His creation. And of course, the fullest revelation of God is in His incarnate Son, Jesus Christ. And because God is infinitely greater than us, right? He, he, is, he is so great, right? It, it is not a matter of, of how much more, but it's in another category altogether. And because He is so much greater than us, we will always have newer and deeper epiphanies about who Jesus is and how He can continue, even though using the same scripture, right? Even though we are still on that same spiritual walk, but still we can have new epiphanies about God it, according to our limited understanding. And so, my friends, that's the idea behind our first epiphany series, Jesus Unmasked. By faith, let us ask God for deeper epiphanies every day. We're asking Jesus to reveal more of Himself, to unmask Himself and show us more of that, that face full of love and mercy. And many times, that face of Jesus is hidden behind the mask of ancient cultures, hidden behind the mask of our, our limited biblical literacy, hidden behind, of course, the mask of the confounding ways that our, our modern thinking has to, to cloud, cloud our understanding of Jesus. But still, God can shine a light through all that things and let us see the Father's face in Jesus Christ. Now, today's Old Testament reading, taken from Isaiah chapter 60, is there in the lectionary partially because it mentions Gentiles bringing gifts in homage to the God of Israel because of God's light shining out of Jerusalem. Right? The people in Gentile nations, they could receive an epiphany and make that journey bringing gifts. The people of God were in exile that's the context of Isaiah 60. The prophet Isaiah consoled them by speaking about the restoration of new Jerusalem. Right? Jerusalem at that time was broken. But the prophet spoke of a time when Jerusalem will be renewed and out of that renewed Jerusalem, the glory of Yahweh will become visible even to the pagan nations. And as a sign of gratitude towards Jerusalem for shining the glory of Yahweh, the nations, these pagan nations, will bring their wealth by land, by sea. They will gather all of their precious things and they will 
bring it to Jerusalem. And some of the things mentioned would be gold for the temple and incense, frankincense for ongoing sacrifice brought not by the people of God, but by the, the Gentiles, the pagan nations. And thus the prophet in Isaiah celebrates one day by the possibility or the certainty that one day the divine light that is shining out of Jerusalem will cause all the nations to acknowledge and enjoy that light and to walk according to that light. Now, as 21st century Christians, right, as people just, who, had, who had just celebrated Christmas, looking back at the passage of Isaiah, it seems so clear to us that, of course, this light is none other than Jesus Christ. And that light foretold by Isaiah came in our Gospel reading for today. By that small light, of the star of Bethlehem, the Magi from the east came from far away Gentile lands. They brought gifts in homage to the true light. Right? They followed the small light, and as they followed the small light, they came upon the true light, true light of true light. That's how the Nicene Creed puts it. Jesus Christ is that true light, the glory of God that shines upon us. Jesus is that light that epiphanizes, right? that manifests God the Father and His love and His care and His plan of salvation to mortal people like us. And of course, the Gentile themselves, the, the Magi, uh, be, being Gentiles themselves, recognized this and they be came bearing gifts fit for a king and thereby fulfilling that expectation in, recorded in the book of Isaiah. Now, speaking of these Magis, we sing hymns, right, about three kings from, from the Orient come bearing gifts. Um, contrary to popular readings, uh, very likely these people, they were not kings. They were likely to be Persian priests or astrologers or some wise um, scholars, right, scholars who at that time they, they, they were looking at the star charts and they were looking at the maps and they were students of ancient literature. And of course, we find in Scripture neither a record of the number of Magi or the names of the Magi. According to 6th century Italian traditions, these, these three Magi, right, the number three appeared, they came looking for the newborn king and they were given names. Caspar, Caspar, or Jess, you know, right, Balthazar, Melchior, Right, you may be familiar with these names. If you, if you just go onto Wikipedia and search names of three kings, right, you will find this, these traditions. The assumptions were, of course, that the three magi were drawn, uh, the, the assumptions that there were three magi were, of course, drawn by the fact that three gifts were being brought. Probably each magi bringing one gift, very convenient, two hands carrying one gift, and these will be gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But what we can, of course, be certain beneath the layers of tradition is that these Magi were certainly Gentiles. They lived in pagan lands. They brought their wealth of gold and incense to seek out and to know more of the true light, of which they had, they had caught a little, bit of, a little glimpse of it in the star, but that led them to dig a little bit deeper and to seek a little bit more. Guided by the light of that star, armed with courage, and conviction to traverse long distance to a distant land, these magi, at the end of their journey, they were rewarded with a fresh epiphany of the light foretold in Isaiah. It turned out that this child was born king of the Jews, but he was not to be found in the palaces. The magi went to the palace, right, to look for King Herod, asking where this new king had been born. But it turned out that, that that fresh epiphany for the Magi was that this new king was not to be found in the palace. Jesus, not just the small light of the world, but the true light of the world, is a different kind of king. A king enthroned in a barn with parents of lowly origins, perhaps in our, in our day and age, we would say of low economic, social economic status. Jesus the king, he is a kind of king who permits himself, who, who allows all of the glory of heaven to reside in a little manger. The light will always bring fresh epiphanies to those who seriously seek after it. Even for people who 
at that in, in our time and age, or in their time and age, were already considered wise, scholars, astronomers, people who were considered brave, those who had courage to take the risk to travel long distances, even for wonderful people like that, the light always brings fresh epiphanies. But only if these people are like the Magi, also clothed in humility, who are willing to submit to the authority of a king who is clothed himself in humility. And so here it is, my friends. Light, the preeminent symbol of Epiphany, not just the day of the Feast of Epiphany, but for this whole season of Epiphany, the preeminent symbol is that of light. Because Epiphany is about the light of Jesus shining into our lives, thereby revealing more of God and inviting us to adore Him more, to worship Him more, and to submit to Him more. Epiphany in this sense, as we start every new calendar year with this season, Epiphany represents our lifelong pilgrimage to seek more of Jesus Christ. And so this being one of the seasons and part of the rhythm of the Christian life, it must always mark our motivation that we will always be seeking light and as that light surely shines into the heart of people who, who seek God, that light will bring fresh epiphanies for us. And so the right response to God in epiphany, as seen in the Magi, is to respond to the light with adoration and with offering. These were people interested and committed to know about Jesus. They were willing to commit time and energy to seek the truth. They were willing to bring the wealth of their whole life, their whole nation, their, their, all their belongings, the best offering. They were willing to bring it before Jesus. So also for us at the start of the year, have we already committed to let this be another year of living and seeking and walking in the light with undivided attention, unadulterated attention? Let, this must be the commitment for us as we start the year. So allow me to repeat the call to action of our watch night service. Will you respond by God's light by committing to do good, to avoid evil, and to attend and to use every means of grace? Those are the usual ways through which we are encountered by the light. Now, my friends, however, adoration and, and offering, these are not the only response to the light. Another response that we see is opposition and skepticism. And we see this in the character of King Herod in the Gospel reading. Instead of being drawn to the light, King Herod felt threatened. He, he felt that this new light would challenge his authority and would upset his way of life. In fact, after God had warned the Magi in a dream not to report back to Herod, what happened? Herod ordered the murder of all innocent boys throughout the land, aged two years old and under. Now, church tradition remembers these little children on a day called the Feast of the Holy Innocents. Right? We may be familiar with uh, Holy Innocents as um, a school, right? but that's where it come, this is where it comes from. Right? We remember that even today, Many people are like Herod. When the light shines into their life, instead of responding with adoration and offering, many people today still oppose the light and they are skeptical about Jesus. Instead of responding with adoration and offerings, many would rather continue walking in sinful ways and they would rather commit murder, like Herod. Sometimes our own hands may not may be clean, may look clean, but that's because we have committed murder in other ways as well. Murdering people, murdering their dignity with our words, murdering unborn children.
murdering murdering the common good through selfish motives. And the list goes on. Epiphany again is a season to remind us that the light continues to show us who God is, and by that it reveals the kingship of God over all creation. That will challenge our own sense of authority, and it will challenge our way of life. And so, my friends, the second, the second possible response to the light is opposition and skepticism. And so, if you are opposing the light in some sense in your life, my friends, let us come before God in all honesty. You can speak to the pastors, myself or Reverend Patrick, you can speak to a close Christian friend. And what's more important is to repent of our sins and not continue to linger and let the, 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 the outworking of sin snowball into bigger and, and deeper and more serious issues. Now, having shared through two responses to the light, there's still a third response. And the third response is indifference. Now, perhaps you've come to that, that, the response that marks out many of our lives. There's a third group of people in the Scripture today whose response to the light is simply to ignore it. Now, these were the chief priests and the teachers of the law that King Herod had gathered when the Magi came to the palace, the Magi had done all the hard work, right? They had, they had looked through the star charts, they had read through the ancient books, and they came to the land where the light was supposed to be. And there the scholars, the, the priests, the religious people were gathered to, to have a discussion about this light. Now, these priests and teachers of the law, they were serious students of Holy They knew the prophecies concerning the light. They were able to direct the Magi to the town of Bethlehem. Yet, they themselves did not join the journey to look for Jesus. By foot, that journey would take about two hours. But they were more interested in spending those two hours on their own activities rather than to look for the true light. For the indifferent group, religion is something to be practiced rather than to be lived out. Religion is kind of like public performance, never personal, seldom practiced in private. Now, two hours for the priests and the scribes, too much time to commit to looking for God. How about us? Is two hours too many to spend seeking and searching Scripture and in prayer? How about one hour? Or maybe half an hour? Is it too much time to spend in adoration and offering, especially that same half an hour or one hour or two hours can be spent in the gym or on Netflix or in tracking the stock market or using social media or on a computer game or even in fruitful activities like cooking, gardening, photography, and the list goes on. The third group chose to respond to the light with indifference. Now, we know the story of this group when the true light epiphanizes more and more in his growing up years and in his ministry years. And we'll cover all those moments of epiphany in the rest of our sermon series during the season of epiphany. We will see this third group, the indifferent group, move from the third group into the second group. We'll read about that in the Gospel readings. Now, my friends, do not remain still in this third group. Do not be an indifferent Christian because we know that sin will only lead us to opposition and skepticism. So three different responses to the light that has come 
three different responses to epiphany, God's love made flesh. Three different responses to God's glory unmasked before us. We can respond as the Magi with adoration, seeking out the truth, offering our gifts of time and energy. Or we can respond as King Herod with opposition and skepticism, perhaps with fear, with, with murder and malice, with lives continuing to be lived in sin. Or perhaps we may, re we may respond as the chief priests and the scribes with indifference, right? L leaving Sunday after Sunday, but with no energy committed to seeking and responding to the light of Jesus Christ. Now, the truth is, most of us have experienced all of this at some point in our spiritual journey. We are, we are seldom all or nothing. Of course, our, the growth, right, the, the, the maturity of the Christian life is to grow towards all of group one and none of the other groups. We call that perfect love. We call that Christian perfection. But in reality, many of us struggle with a little bit of each group at any point in time. Which response describes your current state of heart? If you belong to the second or third group, or if the descriptions in the second and third group are the predominant descriptions of your life right now, my question to you is, what are some barriers stopping you or distracting you from fully responding to Jesus? Now, these will be the questions that I've included in the sermon guide for us to discuss at home or in our small groups. This epiphany, let us begin to explore those personal barriers to trusting and following Jesus. There's nothing here to be learned except for the true state of your life. And you cannot learn that unless you, you, you are willing to take it out and to discuss the state of your life authentically with other people on the journey with you. So my friends, no amount of learning here can help you move from group to group. By the work of the Holy Spirit in your, in, in your heart and with your willingness to take that, that description of your life and to place it before others, to pray and talk about it, that's how we can respond to the light. And so I hope that this season of Epiphany, all of us will come to know Jesus a little bit more we will know the barriers of faith for us and we can experience that the, the, the response of the Magi to grow in our willingness to adore God and to offer Him our gold and incense and myrrh. Now surely, Epiphany reminds, reminds us that our God continues to reveal Himself to us and among us today. So let us be willing to follow that star on a journey of discipleship. Let us be willing to offer our services before the one who is the light of the world. And I hope that the study of the Epiphany lectionary passages will shine light into us and unmask the true Jesus by the help of the Holy Spirit. So let us seek God earnestly throughout the first Epiphany series for the rest of the month of January. But the epiphany that happens when the light shines into us is just one part of epiphany. There is a second part. Will others see in us the epiphany of God's love for the pagan nations, for the Gentile nations? That's the prophecy of Isaiah. Will we arise and shine the light of Jesus in the way we live? Will the light of Jesus, having shone into our, in, into our lives, will it then shine through every disciple of Jesus and shine into the world? Will our discipleship be radical enough to function as epiphany for the world? That's the question. Radical calling, radical living, radical loving. These are the themes for the second epiphany series and we will cover this in February. So first, may the light of Jesus shine into you 
to let you know more about God and your response to that is more earnest seeking of Him to grow in more, more of your love and your holiness, to, to want to adore Him more, to want to serve Him more. And then as, as you bask in the light of Jesus Christ, will that light shine through you as a disciple of Jesus and shine into the world? And when that happens, how will we know it? The Gentiles, the pagan nations, the people who have been waiting for the light to make meaning and purpose of their life, they will see that little light of ours and they will follow it and at the end of it, they will see the true light, Jesus Christ, clothed in humility and love. So allow me to conclude with a final idea about Epiphany. Although Epiphany is only a season, right, and the season of Epiphany will end when the season of Lent begins, but this season represents our lifelong pilgrimage to seek more of Jesus Christ. Many times, the pilgrimage to know Jesus isn't filled with eureka moments, as if every day we, 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 we get a thunderbolt of, of understand, new understanding about who Jesus is. Boom, boom, boom. Epiphany doesn't happen like that. There will, many, there will be many days where life will seem like, like this, like working on a little sliding puzzle. You kind of see what it's about, but it doesn't look quite complete. Right? You know that this leg is supposed to fit somewhere there, but it's not quite in place yet. With nine little squares being moved around, not every move is a winning move. Sometimes we make a wrong move and, and, and we mess up the puzzle a little bit more. And each little square has, has a picture on it and we know it's supposed to fit somewhere. But we continue to follow Jesus, we continue to move those puzzle pieces around. But as we do so, and if you're serious about it, you will realize that soon your life will look like that. No longer nine pieces, but even more complicated. You kind of still know what it's about. You know what this is about? <laughs> you know what creature is this? Reindeer. <laughs> no, 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 it's not, not a reindeer, right? Okay, you, you, I won't reveal the answer to you, right? This is what Epiphany is about. So at first, we, we look at it. We're not quite sure. We know that we can make a face here and, and some limbs there. But until we get into the rhythm of solving the puzzle, until we, we, we find a method that keeps us going, and then one, one moment we will then slide that final piece of puzzle into place, and that moment is like a moment of epiphany. When light floods into the puzzle and we see a clear picture, of course not of the squirrel, that's the answer, but of Jesus Christ. Now, we are used to thinking about epiphanies as eureka moments, instances of unexpected clarity about God. Of course, this is what we hope to achieve each time we come to Scripture, and, and the same thing we want to achieve in the Jesus Unmasked series. But the clarity of Epiphany comes to us unexpectedly when we have spent time dwelling without clarity in thick clouds. Arise, shine. For your light has come, the glory of the Lord rises upon you. The, th this is the preeminent theme of Epiphany, taken from the book of Isaiah. But before the light comes, there is that other verse, the next verse. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. Epiphanies are so rewarding because of the long and arduous work that comes before that. Now, some of the secular academics, they call this longitudinal epiphanies. Epiphanies, not just in the moment, but a long journey. And that whole journey is called a longitudinal epiphany. It is the idea that epiphanies are not solely defined by the instant that they occur, but also by the patient, disciplined, repeating practices that lead us up to the fresh revelation. The Magi didn't just recognize a star in the sky out of the blue. It was the result of a lifetime of watching and waiting, examining the skies, examining and reading the movement of the stars, studying the ancient scriptures about the Bethlehem star, researching the lay of the land and mapping it out for the time that they are ready to make that journey. 
patient, disciplined, repeating practices lead us up to that point of epiphany where we recognize the light of Jesus and by the grace of God, He shines it into our lives and then we are ready to respond correctly. So my friends, longitudinal epiphany is what we are up to every Sunday in this sanctuary and what we are called to do every day in our spiritual practices. We are engaging in a longitudinal epiphany. We come here not to glean interesting biblical tidbits from the sermon, but we participate in patient, disciplined, repeating liturgy, rising and sitting at the same segments, singing the same songs, praying the same Lord's Prayer. We, we proclaim the same doxology, we tell again and again those same familiar Bible stories. And for those of us who are serving, for those of us who will be dedicated later in the service and later on in the month, our weekly commitments, serving people, opening doors, manning the registration counter, leading small groups, visiting the sick people, managing the audiovisuals, preparing and teaching Bible classes, chairing meetings, the list goes on. As we serve, we are engaging in longitudinal epiphanies. We are preparing ourselves. We are seeking God through patient, disciplined, and repeating practices. So I hope that we do not give up when there are no eureka moments in our life because the season of epiphany reminds us that it is not just the instant that we pursue but also the preparation and the journey that is important. May we all grow a little bit deeper in our knowledge of Jesus and grow a little bit more like Him as we set our hearts throughout the rest of the year to participate in longitudinal epiphanies. And for the leaders who will be representing all of us who are serving God, you represent the commitment to seek the light of Jesus in our daily worship and service and life. So may God help us in this season of epiphany to see Jesus more clearly. Let us pray together. Now let us spend some moment to ask God to shine His light into our lives to help us to recognize the kind of responses that we have been presenting to the true light, Jesus Christ, who has come into the world for our sake. How have we been dominantly responding with our wealth, with our time, with our energy? Lord, will you come and encounter each one of us? and speak to us. And also speak to us in the days ahead. Lord, I pray that you will be a lamp for all of us in the darkness. Touch our souls and kindle a fire within our hearts that it may burn brightly and give light to my life, your light, your divine light. And let our bodies, our lives become your temple, lit by the flame of your Holy Spirit at the altar of my heart, and may that light shine within us and shine onto the people around us that it may drive away the darkness of sin and ignorance. Thus, let us be lights of the world, manifesting the bright beauty of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in His name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.